Cool? Good, good. All right, hi everyone, my name is Nick Moore. Um, again, still. Um, today we're talking a little bit about open source in the enterprise world and we're starting with the story of Alice. Alice is sitting there by the river one day watching Hacker News scroll past and thinking, oh, you know, what will I do now? I could learn a new language, I could start a new project, I could do just about anything. When past, past runs a white rabbit, and she notices two things about the white rabbit. First, he's wearing a suit, which seems a little unusual in this industry. And also he's carrying a Blackberry phone, which is, I thought they were gone by now, but apparently, no, they still have them. So she thinks I could learn Haskell, I could earn money. Nah, she takes off in hot pursuit of the rabbit. And as we know from the story, down the hole she goes. And as she's falling, she thinks, well, hopefully I'll land in a big comfy air on chair in one of those offices with like its own foosball table and all of that sort of stuff. And down and down and down she falls until she finds herself in a big, vast open plan office lined with tiny, tiny little monitors through each of which she can see a beautiful garden, <laughs> Windows XP. And she thinks, if only I could fit my entire IDE in that tiny little monitor, I'd be able to get through to that beautiful garden, but she can't. <laughs> I've just taken a job up in a, a enterprise-y kind of situation. I've also had previous jobs on the other sides of the desk and, and um, as a supplier to large companies and so on and so forth. And now I'm dealing with them as a, a, a contractor who is now dealing with suppliers, trying to sell stuff to us and so on and so forth. So this is just more or less some reflections on uh, what it's like to try and get open source into an enterprise, because I'm a big fan of open source, what it's like to try and make that sort of sell internally to say, we should be using these technologies as opposed to these technologies that cost you a bundle and don't work very well, and so on and so forth. The, uh, through the window we see the oper standard operating environment, and this is one of the hugest traps for open source. It's very, very difficult to get this stuff off the ground. Um, um, in Nick's presentation about Python, Packaging, you mentioned uh, the problems of Windows packaging for Python. Uh, if your standard operating environment is all stuck at Windows XP, you have a number of different traps preventing you from progressing anywhere. Um, it's really common out there. You're also stuck with tools like Word as a document management system and SharePoint and things like that. It's very hard to work in an agile manner if you're dealing with a, a revision control system that doesn't understand forking doesn't understand merging, doesn't understand this. Fortunately, there's a couple of really good things you can do. You can set up Git and not tell anyone. This may seem a little unconventional, a little like you're breaking the rules, but actually you're just putting files on a shared drive like you were asked to. Those files happen to be a Git repository. You happen to be able to push to them. They're a shared drive. The systems admins there understand shared drives. It's okay. Often there'll be a, a mandated um, issue control system that is clumsy and difficult to use and is full of little rules and workflows and things like that that mean that no one really uses it properly. You can just use Trello or something like that. If you tried to use some other Git issues management system, people would go, no, you're setting up your own issues management system. Trello doesn't look like an issues management system. It looks like a whole bunch of little cards. So everyone goes, oh, it's a whole bunch of little cards. Yeah. I wonder what he's doing with them. And they don't look closely enough to realize that what you're actually doing is managing your sub-issues down in, in little cards. There's also portable apps which let you run proper programs on a desktop that won't let you install anything but IE. The other thing that I've done before when no one was looking is you take your entire Windows partition on your work assigned machine, shrink it, install a Linux partition, and then run the Windows machine as a virtual inside the Linux box so that you can actually get back out of the, you can have the SOE sitting there and get back out of it, all on the same hardware. Don't tell anyone you've done it, they'll be cross. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the computer, it just died. <laughs> um, another problem you have is access to the internet. This is an error message from one of my, my uh, clients. In case anyone can't read it there, it says, access to this web page was blocked because it's in the category freeware and software downloads. So you're trying to go out and download uh, open source packages and people are banning them because they're freeware. Also, sometimes they'll ban forum systems that you might want to get stuff from because they're forum systems and they go, oh, you're probably just talking about the football. So you're often blocked in by the internet 
access. Also, sometimes if you're trying to access more interesting systems, you'll hit problems with corporate proxies, URL restrictions, limits on the current, current connections you can make, which breaks a lot of things that use WebSockets. Um, probably unintentional URL mangling. I'm not quite sure what does it, but every now and then you'll discover that the URL the server sees is not the same one as that you put in your browser. Some proxy in the meantime has picked up on it and it's not a very good proxy and it's been there since 1993 and it doesn't work properly. You might just want to buy a 4G modem at the start of your contract and hide it in your desk drawer and deny knowing where it came from. <laughs> this is a little comment about the, the origins of enterprises, I guess. Um, it's from a, a really interesting book about remaining creative in an enterprise situation called Orbiting the Giant Hairball by a guy called Gordon McKenzie who worked as a, a creative at uh, Hallmark for many, many years. And he's saying that the metaphor of enterprise as a hairball is that you have two little hairs, two little procedures, two little roles that unite and they get wrapped around each other and before long they're joined by more and more and more and more. Till in the end, no one really knows where they came from. All you've got is this giant hairball and this affects a lot of things when you're trying to get anything done in an enterprise situation. The hairball is a, a fact you're stuck with. You have to work out how to work around the periphery of the hairball. Don't try to cut it in half, you can't do it. Don't try to ignore it, you can't do that either. You have to work around it by sort of gently skimming around the surface, by orbiting it. For example, when you're developing anything, any project in a big enterprise, you're not a developer, you're part of a big team of strange looking animals. You have managers, you have project managers who are completely separate, you have business analysts who do something. You have systems administrators who do rather a lot of things but won't tell you what they are. You have sales and marketing people, you have finance people, and at some point someone is probably actually going to want to use what you develop. All those people have different roles, they're all really important. Business analysts who hopefully aren't watching this video right now, hi, um, actually do have an important role. They go out to the business and they find out what the business wants, and as long as you work out how to use them and how to understand the requirements they bring back, they perform a really, really useful role. The important thing is to remember they're mostly not technical, so the requirements you get back have to be understood through that sort of filter of this is a requirement I'm getting from a, a business analyst. They've said they need this. That word may not mean the technical meaning I'm trying to assign to it. Things like document store may not mean actually a document store. Things like XML may not mean XML. I've had one instance where a requirement says this must have a, be able to import and export XML. And of course, anyone with a technical brain goes, in what schema? I don't know any schema. Wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean you need to import XML in any schema? Does this mean I have to write a general parser for XML schemas or something like that? No, they mean you have to tick a requirement on this form that says you import XML because it's a requirement, because that's the requirement we made up. If you export and import any kind of XML, you meet that requirement, move on. The most important thing out of all of these people is to find, as a, a, either a supplier or as a, a developer, to find a champion for your project. Someone who has some power and influence inside the hairball, inside the company, who can actually drive the project forward and stop it getting stalled forever on silly, trivial matters. Weirdly enough, those people are generally not the people who have official authority over anything. Often it'll be someone in sales or marketing or something like that who has a budget and has an ability to drive the company along. And whenever it gets stuck, says, oh, well, it's the board of directors meeting next week. I guess I'll try and get it brought up. And the next thing you know, you do have a budget and things are moving along because it's important to some important client of theirs. If you leave that to the IT group, often nothing happens. The end users probably are part of that too. If you can get end users excited about your project, They'll drive it up through their management structure and you'll get requests to say, when is this thing gonna be ready? When can we do this? Currently upgrading a, a company from paper-based uh, stock control to um, uh, barcodes and scanners based stock control directly into a database. And the, the guys working on that job are really, really excited to have this upgrade. They'll no longer be using a pencil in a one degree freezer to do stock control they'll be using a barcode scanning gun, which they can do with gloves on. At one degree, that makes you much happier. A word about project management. The 
overall view of project management with these projects is that progress is a linear thing. That's that big blue arrow running up there. Time passes, things get achieved, you go along the blue line, everyone is happy. One of the problems as developers is that we don't really think of progress the same way as project managers think of progress. So you, it's really easy trap to say, oh, we're 80% there and it's only a week in, 80%. Look, here we are, this is our little red curve here. We've just shot up here, we've developed our interface, we've used this automatic library, it's templated everything out, we've got this admin interface, it's 80% there because 80% of the functions that we think about are there. That is not what your project manager means. Your project manager means 80% uh, of the tasks done, okay? 80% of the tasks are not done. There's not been testing, there's not been documentation, there hasn't gone around again. What you've probably got is you've thrown together a prototype that represents about 10% of it. Now on a slightly cynical angle, the best curve to have is about this green one where you're slightly behind all the time so that you don't get any resources taken away from you. <laughs> and at the last minute you pull a rabbit out of your hat and you get slightly ahead so that you look like a superstar when everyone's talking about you. And then you still finish. Note that the red curve and the green curve end up in the same place. They do about the same amount of work. But the guy who did the red curve looks like an idiot. And the guy who did the green curve looks like a superstar. And that's how you'll be remembered. So, you may want to tailor your reporting. That's all I'm gonna say. That's, that's... <laughs> Temper your progress reporting with a little bit of a knowledge of what it's trying to achieve. What they're really asking you is, are you blocked on anything? But they're asking you and you have to, it's a bit like Jeopardy or something. You have to answer in the form of a number instead of a question. And the number should be a number about in the middle somewhere so that you indicate to the project manager you're not blocked, you're not stopped, you're not receding backwards. You're still proceeding. But don't take away your resources, please. What you have to remember is that all of these things are tasks. Planning, reading, documenting, testing, selecting products to use, prototyping. All of those things are products. So if you go to yourself, I'd you're trying to force me into a waterfall process here, right? We'll do requirements and specs and now we'll develop and now we'll test and now we've finished. If that doesn't suit you, and it probably shouldn't, then you can include a prototype phase by including that as a set of tasks at the start. So you might say the first 20% of my project is gonna be spent prototyping and break that down into tasks and report on those tasks as well. For God's sake, don't tell anyone that you intend to have a working product at the end of that 20%, or they'll think it's finished, and then, the <laughs> then they'll recalibrate your graph on you. Just deny that, don't give it a nice user interface. Most people won't realize it's actually finished if you don't put a nice looking style sheet on it. They'll think it's just a prototype. So, all those things are important tasks. Also, as, as Rob mentioned before, upstreaming might be a task you want to include on that list. If you're using open source software, Upstreaming is a really, really good thing to do and, and you absolutely should be doing it if you can get legal to agree to it. Include it as a task in there, just bury it into the project plan, bury it into your tasks and include that as something that you need to spend time on. Um, whether you need to explain the details of arguing on internet forums about coding style to project managers is another matter, but it's worth uploading this stuff. It takes away work that you would otherwise have to do to re-patch things later. It's, it's definitely worthwhile. You can also run, if you're using Git, you can also run multiple of these sort of phases in parallel. As requirements change, and they do constantly, you can be hacking on your prototype to keep that up to date and make sure your interfaces all work while trying to make a nice version in parallel at the same time. That means you don't need to stop progress, you can still have good standards, good coding standards, but still have rapid hacking all at once. All right, speaking of requirements, strange requirements. I, I put in a whole section on this. this these guys are, um, have just been asked by the Queen of Hearts to paint all her white roses red, in case you don't remember the story. And this happens quite a lot. You'll have a requirement that exists and no one can actually remember why. Um, the XML thing I mentioned before is an example of that. We had a, a customer with exactly that problem. It turns out that many, many years ago, they'd been burnt badly by proprietary database standards that they couldn't get their data in or out of. And so someone had made a rule, and the rule was it must be able to export everything as XML. 
That's actually fairly sensible when you think about it, right? If your choice is to reverse engineer an XML document or to reverse engineer a binary C data structure based file, you would probably rather reverse engineer the XML document, right? As long as it's not docx. <laughs> as long as it's not an obscure binary format cunningly hidden in XML format like docx, for example, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, as, as long as you've got some kind of vaguely comprehensible by human structure, it's, it's a lot easier to work with. So that sort of thing, no one remembers why that's there, but that's generally why that kind of thing's there. Sometimes as a vendor, you might be asked about another kind of feature. And the only reason you're being asked about this feature is that your competitor has a list of all the things they do and they have little green ticks next to them all. And so someone who has to now assess your product has taken that list cut the little green ticks off, emailed it to you and said, please put a ticker across. The reason they're doing that is because they're part of an enterprise. They have to have a meeting to decide which vendors to follow up with. You need to respond. They need some questions. Rather than have the meeting with nothing to talk about and coming back and forth, they want a list. Sometimes these features are irrelevant. Sometimes they're stupid. Sometimes they're just a bad idea. But you should put a yes or a no next to each of them. Sometimes things are in there just because they've been in a Gartner report or an info world or something like that and they're trendy in that world right now and no one really knows why, but that's what happens. It's better to be able to say yes than no, obviously, but it's also much better to say no than maybe or not answer the question or something like that. Because if you don't answer the question, you say, oh yeah, maybe, or you say yes to something that is just a bad idea, you might be stuck with it as a requirement and then you might actually have to implement it. And if it's a bad enough idea, you're better off saying no in the first place and explaining why you don't do that. Um, if you do get a request from a, an enterprise to provide one of these kinds of response documents, for God's sake, respond to it in the format it's asked to be responded in. If that means borrowing someone's computer and filling in an Excel spreadsheet cell with a colored background, just do that because this is just the way some companies work. They have procedures for how they do things. If you try to buck that by sending them a brochure or a, a PDF or a, some other format, it will make everyone's life that tiny bit harder and then they won't like you anymore. All right, a little word on surviving success if you're developing projects internally. Projects often grow. They grow well beyond what they were when you started doing them. For another client, I built a project that was originally just a, a document retrieval system for clients. It's now being used internally. Um, oh, it grew, sorry, it grew from there to have a payment system. So it was letting them retrieve invoices, then it let them pay invoices. Now it lets people internally pay invoices on it. It's now effectively a, gone from a, yeah, it's nice if it runs all the time, to a 24-7 production system with still no one really properly maintaining it. Uh, it's a fairly big and important system. It's moved a lot of payments and in total it's moved around $17 million. It's really just a bunch of Perl scripts, but it's grown and grown and grown until it's become essential to the company. It's very hard to survive that kind of success because the bigger the project grows, the more risk you're at of the whole thing going wrong. Requirements tend to get outgrown. The database you specified is no longer sufficient to do the job or doesn't have enough features. There's ongoing maintenance to worry about and upgrade paths. Um, you know, there, I have servers out there that are still running Ubuntu 10.10 because no one's going to spend any money to upgrade them. It works, doesn't it? It's working. Why would I spend money to upgrade this system? You'll have to change stuff. What can you do? At least it's an LTS one, but it's out, of, it's out of its time now by about a while. The other thing is integration with their existing systems. Those systems change. The backends that you're talking to change. And if you're really lucky, someone will tell you about it before they do it. I wouldn't count on it. Ideally, what you need to do is hand the product actually over to someone in the company. But that can be really tricky to find. Who, who, which, uh, not many enterprises have actually expertise in open source products and Linux and things like that. So that's the bad news. And, and 
I still haven't found an answer to that one. I think the, the answer is probably to become big enough that you can give people maintenance contracts and do a thing like that. And I suspect that's what all our friends from Catalyst are, are fundamentally going to be living off is maintenance on this sorts of things because it's something that needs to happen. Someone needs to support these sorts of products for big companies to really profit from them. There is some good news though, which I wanted to just talk about. The large systems that enterprises use are starting to open up at last. They used to be very, very walled garden. There's no way to get the data in and out of them. You had to do horrible, horrible things like talking directly to the, the underlying database in ODBC. So you could talk directly to the database tables underneath enterprise systems and get their data in and out. It's a little sneaky, it's not really a good idea, but it worked. Then people started supporting things like SOAP and, and things like that, which were good but somewhat complicated to talk to, very specialised and you had to be very specific about how you talk to them. We now seem to be moving on to OData, which is RESTful, which is nice. It's a start. It's much simpler to talk to. It has like metadata embedded in each query rather than being a big hairy WSDL kind of thing. For example, SAP, SAP, the, the, the great Leviathan, <laughs> the Leviathan of enterprise resource planning systems is now speaking OData. You can get a, an approved, proper, built-in NetWeaver gateway product which supports OData interfaces. Um, OData is RESTful. It has fairly horrible syntax for querying, but it's a RESTful standard and it's widely supported and there are libraries to use it if you want to and stuff like that. And it can emit JSON data, which is quite nice. It's quite easy, therefore, to write an HTML5 app or something like that that talks to those services. A lot of these enterprise services have very fixed ways of thinking about their data. They, they have a form and you fill in the form and the form goes back and it comes back with an error and it goes back and it comes back with an error. And it goes around and around that cycle until finally a transaction actually succeeds and then it drops you back to the main menu again. That's pretty much life in SAP. That doesn't work very well. It works okay for people with a lot of training and a big desktop. It works very, very badly on a mobile device or in anything like that. So there's an opportunity there to take this open data interfaces to these big systems and build your own little sidecar systems hanging off the side of them. You can extract the data out of the main database into a little local database that's maybe quicker in terms of transactions per second, more flexible, et cetera, et cetera. You can denormalize that data while you're at it, which is kind of good. You can extract stuff into a message queue for processing and, and sending real-time updates and things like that to mobile devices. You can actually talk to those OData services directly from HTML5, which I'm doing for a project at the moment, talking to SAP OData from an HTML5 app. Um, or you can use the, the SQL Server integration services and BizTalk and things like that. One option there for you, if you're worried about maintaining an open source application, which has its own database, is to just uh, grin and bear it and keep all your state off in SQL Server, even though it's a little painful, even though you'd rather use Postgres, even though you'd rather use something more fun, because that way you're, you're cutting back your maintenance requirements enormously, because they already have a DB person who already maintains that database and maintains its backups. If your application server stops working, obviously it's a problem but it's not a huge problem. If your database suddenly disappears and it turns out the backup script you wrote didn't work anymore because someone shut the backup server off when you weren't looking and they still haven't actually got Nagios working properly and nothing actually got notified, etc., because it was behind their firewall. Don't ask me how I know. Um, that is more of a problem. So if you can keep your state instead in a server they do know how to maintain, that's good. One problem with this is that you're now duplicating functionality that the ERP systems or whatever do, do. So it's very easy to say, I'll just take that interface and copy it and make it small so it runs on a phone. I'll use that same paradigm. That's not the way to do it. Go out, work with the business analysts, talk to the business, talk to the end users, work out what they're actually trying to achieve in their workflows and develop to that. Um, what you can actually do then is provide the company a lot of value by saying, well, here is what you're trying to achieve. Here is the exact steps you need to take. Here is an interface that will let you do that. Here is a project. And that can get you really good success without a, a huge overhead in actually having to build the whole thing from scratch. You're just building outriggers onto these big enterprise systems. 
So basically beware usability lock-in, beware the, the fact that people within a company make an enormous number of assumptions about the way that things must work. All right, so um, questions or comments? Has anyone else had similar experiences in the enterprise-y world? <laughs> yep, right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this, this is a bit of a, a, a um, traps for young players kind of uh, presentation more because um, these are certainly some things that I, I wish I'd realised about 10 years ago when I was just sort of starting to get from getting to larger customers and get involved more with a, a, my own business developing stuff within bigger companies, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the issues I've had... One of the issues I've had trying to get open source into sort of enterprise and, um, and agencies as well when they're dealing yeah. with enterprise is the fact that at the end of the day, you know, enterprises want someone to sue if things go wrong. <laughs> um, and they yeah. just don't, legal will just won't sign off on open source right. um, like GNU and, and everything else. They want to go with someone else that they're, you know. Yep. So how do you get around that when at the end of the day, if you're based on something that no one is going to assume responsibility for? Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, I think probably the way you do it is you do it through a company that does assume responsibility for it. Um, like the Red Hat model, for so example. So effectively, or, or like your, your, your company assumes responsibility for that. Um, uh, and charges for that liability, of course. Yeah, yeah, you have to. You have to um, take that on board. You have in liability insurance to pay for. You have lawyers to pay to tell you whether you're liable or not. You know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a whole different business model. I think um, uh, Arjun mentioned the whole, are you a company or are you a, a what thing? And I, and I should have mentioned in here, actually, my, in, in my experience, uh, forget being a sole trader these days. No one will deal, no enterprise-sized companies will deal with sole traders anymore because it, it leaves a lot of gray area with liability. But even um, if you're not talking about the financial liability, if just if a service goes down and yep. it's because of an open source component bug or something, yep. then you kind of you're stuck having to potentially fix it or yeah, do yeah, everything. Yeah. So I mean, I was in an agency where our attitude was build it yourself rather than use someone else's because then we can fix it. Yep. And it meant because we on charge the customer anyway. Yep. It didn't really matter. They paid for it, but it just made <laughs> things slower a lot more work repeating it yourself. is tricky and, and as you say if, if you're dependent on some other product and then it gets hopelessly broken then how do you explain it to the client you know you do have to assume some responsibility and you you do have to basically charge for that as part of the model software is actually quite expensive and and to not to divert myself into a completely different rant here but companies shouldn't expect to get something for for nothing with these sorts of things they they the software itself is free, but what's important is not so much that they don't have to pay for it as they don't have to license it. The sell that you're making to big companies is not, it's free. The, the sell you can make them is, it's extensible, you can change it any time you want, you never lose ownership of it, you can't have it taken away from you. That's much more the, the, the requirement. A big risk for big companies, for example, if they don't have licensing sorted out properly, is that if they, uh, what's the... De, de acquisition is a good word. I just <laughs> got that one recently. If they, they split off a part of the company and turn it back into its own company, are they able to license the software that that sub company depends on to that sub company, or do they not have that legal right? One of the nice things about open source is, well, yes, they do. And I'd say to, to what I'd say to big companies is, for any given bit of IP you should e that you have developed, you should ensure that every part of that IP is either assigned to you so that you own it and can do whatever you want with it, or is open sourced so that if you do fork your company effectively, both halves can keep it. You know, and, and I think if you lo look at a lot of other licensing, that can be really, really risky for companies. So I think you can actually sell to companies the idea that open source reduces their risk because it reduces their legal risks of how do you handle changes in the status of the company and things like that. Um, and I think you have to, present that to them as a, as a balance. On the one hand, you're taking on some risk that things will not work and you won't have anyone to sue. On the upside, you can get it fixed by any number of companies. If my company goes under, you can ask one of my competitors. And in fact, it's not unreasonable at all to say, here are some of my competitors. Go talk to them as well. You know, it's, it's, the open source world is, is small enough that all of, all of us are fundamentally 
working towards the same goal, which is achieving things for our customers and making things work. So, you know, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you.